Okay. All right. Wonderful. Thank you, JP. Is this too loud now or is this good? Good. Perfect. Uh, anyway, thank you for the invitation. Thank you all for coming on a beautiful winter morning. Um, so I'm going to talk about this. I think this is going to be more of kind of a hybrid research with uh, extra tutorial material thrown in kind of talk. So it's really going to be focused on our work at Columbia, um, trying to refine the process of, of growing crystals of transition metal dichalcogenides. If we have time, I'll show you some stuff on graphene CVD synthesis as well, which is a, a little bit surprising. Um, but uh, what I've done is added a bunch of introductory material to really show kind of why we got into this business at all and, and you know, how do we look at the quality of these materials. So we're going to start with that. And I hope, yeah, okay. Some of these were just rearranged this morning, so there's going to be a little. Okay, all right. So there will be a couple of slides out of order here, but we can all adapt to that. So again, uh, we're all excited about a lot of the 2D materials, and one of the big uh, classes of 2D materials is transition metal dichalcogenides, uh, MOS2, the, the sulfides, selenides, and tellurides are kind of the main versions, but there are many others. Uh, they're interesting for a whole bunch of different reasons. They have very strong light matter interactions. So if you take monolayers, they have this very strong excitonic resonance. You get very strong absorption and photoluminescence. Um, they have very interesting uh, kind of uh, spin texture that they have all the electrons live in, in the, and holes live in these valleys at the K point. So it looks like gapped graphene. But gap graphene, where the valleys are spin polarized, so the K valleys will have spin up and spin down, and K prime will have spin down and spin up, um, with slightly different texture depending on the type of material. And then, of course, you're going to hear a lot uh, this week about making twisted structures, uh, all of these new moiré uh, heterostructures. When we have 2D semiconductors, we can trap excitons in the moiré lattice, you'll hear about this, I think from our team at Columbia and some of the folks from Cornell as well, um, uh, that you know, all of a sudden kind of allow you to do things a lot like it's done in the uh, cold atom community where you can you know, trap, trap uh, atoms on lattices. Now we can trap excitons on lattices also. Um, so the, the big issue here though, is that if we want to really get to the quantum limit, if we want to realize the promise of these materials and all of this crazy quantum stuff, we need clean materials, right? And so the example we've always been kind of inspired by is the example of gallium arsenide. So gallium arsenide is this amazing material that you, grow, you can uh, make uh, very clean heterostructures by molecular beam epitaxy. And uh, what you can see is this is kind of a classic plot. Uh, this is uh, mobility is a function of temperature. So in all of these, you know, generally, if you have a, a, um, an electron gas, any kind of good uh, you know, doped semiconductor, what you'll see is mobility increasing as we cool down, as we quench out the phonons in the material. And then generally, you'll have uh, mobility then going flat as a function of temperature, and that's your disorder limited mobility. And so what you see is, you know, very generically kind of this family of curves where you follow the same phonon limited mobility, but as the synthesis gets better and better, you increase the mobility due to disorder. So you reduce disorder and this low temperature mobility goes up. And uh, you know you can see that the dramatic improvement over you know 30 years, we see one, two, three, almost four orders of magnitude improvement in low temperature uh, mobility. Yeah. So now I think the record is something like 30 million low temperature mobility. This is mean free paths of millimeters or so. So really, absolutely amazing material. And with that, you get you know, two Nobel, two Nobel prizes and, you know, perhaps more, but certainly 
uh, just a ton of amazing science, all kinds of very interesting uh, quantum states. So, you know, we've been thinking a while about trying to follow the same path for 2D materials. And, you know, in very generically, we have to reduce disorder. And we can think of disorder both maybe intrinsic is not the, exactly the right word here, but uh, disorder that lives on the material. So the, 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 the disorder in the material itself, this can be edges, this can be grain boundaries, but mostly what I'm, what I'm gonna be concentrating on here is single atomic point defects. That seems to be the real challenge in the transition metal by calcogenides. But then um, also uh, we have material, the disorder that's extrinsic to the material, the environmental disorder. And when we have a 2D material, uh, reducing environmental disorder is key because all of the atoms are on the surface. And so that these materials are incredibly sensitive to disorder. So you have to pay attention to what your substrate is. You have to pay attention during fabrication. Do you have strain that's uh, introduced or do you have any kind of other adsorbase? So all of these things become very important. So again, the, you know, just to kind of give a big picture summary, here's, here's the issue. When we have, we, we got very spoiled by graphene. It's just this amazing material. Um, graphene is when you buy a good crystal of Kish graphite, the, the, the actual graphene lattice is nearly perfect. The defect density is below 10 to the nine uh, per square centimeter. Uh, so we have very, very low disorder. I, you know, I, I can't really think of any papers uh, doing either STM or TEM of, of these um, uh, natural crystals where you actually see any defects, right? You always just see this perfect lattice. So we had in our minds for many years that, you know, exfoliated equals perfect. And it took a long time to, you know, get break that paradigm, which was... We were again spoiled, and it was it was uh, you know really only true for one material basically. Um, and the challenge with the transition metal like dichalcogenides is we have both disorder in the crystal, uh, so we call it intrinsic, but it's really just you know crystal in disorder. But then also also we have the environmental disorder as well. And so how do we deal with all of those? So let me first talk a little bit about reducing the environmental disorder. Um, that's kind of a, a you know, a, a very fun story and it led us to wonderful things in graphene. And, you know, the first thing we did just historically was to see if we could do the same thing um, with, uh, with the TMDs, right? So this actually, the, the, the story of environmental disorder actually comes, a lot of the, the pioneering work was done here at the University of Maryland. Um, as well as others, other other locations. But uh, you know, the basic idea is that when we first started exfoliating 2D materials and especially graphene, we exfoliated them on this kind of magic thickness of silicon dioxide that gave you the right uh, optical contrast. And so it was natural to start building devices on that same platform. And so uh, you know, the the idea was that we were building devices on top of silicon dioxide. And the problem is that the surface of silicon dioxide is not a particularly wonderful place. You know, the, the semiconductor industry would never ever think of trying to make devices on top of silicon dioxide. You, you make the clean silicon and then you put the oxide on top of that. Um, the silicon dioxide, even when it's polished, is still uh, somewhat rough, but more important, it has it's not a crystalline material. So you always have dangling bonds and these dangling bonds will have extra charge. Um, you also have, uh, it's a little bit porous so you can trap water which and ions which can move in and out when you make transport measurements and all kinds of, you get all kinds of funny hysteresis. Um, but you know, in general, there's a lot of charge disorder in these substrates and you can see that if you take an STM image of graphene on top of silicon dioxide uh, and map the location of the charge neutrality point in energy. And you can see it, it varies from place to place because you have a electrostatic disorder. And so this, again, you know, is a, is a big problem. 
And so if you look at, for instance, the conductivity or the resistivity as a function of density, you can see this rather broad peak, um, this, this Dirac peak in graphene. Uh, and you can see that the transport behavior on silicon dioxide doesn't change very much as you cool down. And this, again, if you go back to the example of gallium arsenide, if you see something that doesn't get uh, where the mobility or doesn't go up as you cool down, it tells you that your, your disorder level is very high. And so that's what we had here. We had a highly disordered material, and there was a, a lot of discussion in the early days about what was the source of the disorder. There were kind of different camps uh, about, is it, is it ripples and mechanical disorder? That was led by the, the folks in Manchester. And here at, at um, uh, Maryland, there was uh, the camp that uh, really looked at the charge disorder. And that, that seemed to be the, the uh, winning argument in the end. There was some beautiful work, both kind of theory by the Sarma's group and, and uh, Michael Fuhrer's group when he was here, showing very directly that you could manipulate this uh, charge disorder and you could, you, could, uh, you could introduce charge disorder and get exactly the results predicted by theory. Okay. So what do you do to get around that, right? So this is attacking this basic issue of charge disorder led us at Columbia to uh, thinking about other substrates and the substrate uh, that we identified was hexagonal boron nitride. This is you know, the same stuff that a lot of you probably are already working with, um, made by uh, Taniguchi and Watanabe from, from Japan and until they have to retire. So. And there's a major worldwide crisis, but uh, we're getting there. Um, and, uh, you know, we started over the years to learn how to stack graphene on boron nitride and make cleaner and cleaner devices. And you can see kind of right away, even this is relatively early on, you can see much lower uh, charge disorder in these STM maps of graphene on boron nitride. So we wrote a, a a review paper about this kind of disorder issue a couple of years ago and just somewhat arbitrarily divided the kind of progress in the field into these four generations with, you know, first generation, just scotch tape right onto SiO2. The second generation was using polymer to transfer graphene onto boron nitride, but you still have some environmental disorder on the top. The third was in about 20, 12, 2013, we learned to make these stacks with uh, graphene inside encapsulated in between two pieces of boron nitride and bring in contacts from the edge. And even more recently, we've learned that uh, adding graphite as gates actually reduces the charge disorder even more. So that's kind of generations one through four. And you can see this you know, amazing result where you can stack graphene and boron nitride. We image them from cross-sectional imaging. And miraculously, we see these atomic planes with seemingly no, uh, no uh, impurities, no contamination at the interface. This is actually incredibly surprising when you think about it, because we know that all of this is done in air on a desktop. We know that anything that you expose to air instantly is covered in some sort of junk, right? You know, all of the, I always say, you know, all of the wonderful smells of New York City, right? all of the, you know, aromatic hydrocarbons will instantly stick to graphene, right? Uh, so, you know, what we know happens in these interfaces, especially the kind of, uh, you know, very low friction interfaces is that when we bring graphene and boron nitride together, the, uh, all, a lot of that uh, contamination is squeezed out. So these are kind of magically self-cleaning interfaces. We also know that they're squeezed out over a certain length and then they form these bubbles that we have to work around. And you know, we're, we're, we at Columbia right now, we're trying to work on techniques to keep improving that process as well. But still, this is quite good, yeah. Do you find that um, with these uh, heterostructures that the initial quality of the graphene matters less? Uh, again, you know, uh, the question is, you know, what about the initial quality of the graphene? So I, I think 
in that case, you can compare, say, exfoliated graphene, which really is for us always perfect, um, to CVD grow graphene, which can be of varying quality. And, and you can absolutely, you know, I think, let me turn it around a little and say that if you want to understand the quality of your graphene, the best way to do it is to do the state of the art best encapsulation so that you're removing that whole variable of environmental disorder. And I've had lots of arguments with people at conferences who are claiming, you know, some kind of improved synthesis of graphene. They'll maybe talk about it later today. And then they put the, their graphene on SiO2 and measure it. And they say, look, it's, it's perfect. So, you know, look, it, it looks nice, but you have no idea how perfect it is because you're introducing a ton of disorder from the environment. So. Uh, I was going to ask just about boron nitride. Is there really still one source? There are now, there, there are a couple of sources. And if we can find a space for a big oven we just bought, there are hopefully, hopefully going to be a, a third source as well. Uh, I thought Ames was doing this. Uh, there, there was a, there's a group at Kansas State, the oh. Jim Akers group. So okay. A lot of there, but then he moved to NSF. So, okay. So when we, a, a very simple way, if you look at graphene to measure the, the level of charge disorder is just look at the width of the Dirac peak. It's not a perfect measure, but it's, we've kind of shown that it's pretty darn good. And you can see very dramatic decreases in the width of that Dirac peak. This is all measured at, at low temperature, right? So we can see that basically the width of that Dirac peak, if you plot uh, resistance or resistivity versus carrier density, and you measure kind of the, the full half max of that peak, that gives you a very good measure of the charge disorder. And you can see that's improved by about two orders of magnitude, five times 10 to the 11 in kind of graphene on SiO2 to mid 10 to the nine in the, the latest uh, devices. And this is very close to what you see when you just cleanly exfoliate graphene suspended away from the substrate. Uh, so we're really getting very, very close to, if not to the intrinsic limit. And as far as we can tell, this is now limited by the disorder level in the boron nitride. Um, we can also measure the quantum Hall effect. Um, I'm sorry, I just rearranged a bunch of, okay. Just forgot how I rearrange it. So I'll get back to a little bit of what we can use when we do kind of quantum transport. But you know, just the, 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 the level of detail you can see in the quantum Hall effect is related to the Landau level broadening, um, which is kind of an energy you know, smearing of our states in energy. Uh, and that tells you a lot about the, the, the quality of your material. And we can see that in the kind of the first generation of graphene, which was incredibly impressive is that you could put graphene on silicon dioxide, measure transport, cool it down, and you could see quantum Hall effect. Uh, what you could see is this fourfold degeneracy. So you could see very clearly these kind of two, six, 10 Landau level structure. As we started to make it cleaner, we started breaking that degeneracy. So we started seeing all of the integer states. Then we started to see fractional states. And you know now if you just kind of look at a fourth generation device. This is a very high temperature or very high magnetic field, 36 Tesla. But you can see now a very complex uh, series of fractional quantum all states. And if you kind of just hold this up next to you know, recent data from gallium arsenide, it doesn't look all of that different, not to the, you know, at least to the, not to the trained gallium arsenide eye maybe, but to the rest of us. These, these are starting to really look like uh, comparable materials. Our mobilities still aren't as high. We also can't make, uh, we can't have mean free paths as long because we can't make devices that are a millimeter in size. Um, but it, it turns out that the interactions in graphene are stronger. So those two effects kind of balance out and the, the richness of the, the quantum Hall states are roughly comparable. Okay, so that's a little bit of an introduction to what we look at for materials quality, 
Um, let's add now, what are we thinking about materials quality for uh, the transition metal dichalcogenides? I've shown this slide already, so I'll skip that. Again, uh, this is you know, some more, uh, another way of kind of looking at mobility versus temperature. You can really understand these mobility versus temperature curves from theory, kind of combining all of the different scattering processes, right? So you have kind of impurity background scattering. This is gallium arsenide. You have remote impurities from the substrate. And then you have these different types of phonons that, that have different temperature dependencies. So all of these things combine to give you some measured uh, mobility as a function of temperature. You notice here we're in the meters squared per volt second, so multiply by 10 to the four here. So this is again, you know, this is around 10 million mobility or something. If you look at uh, the same theory, you can do exactly the same theory for transition metal dichalcogenides on different substrates. Uh, you have to kind of plug in different levels of charged impurity disorder, uh, which are done kind of in these different curves here, and that gives you different plateaus at low temperature. And just this was this paper showed data, kind of original data for um, for MOS2 sitting on SiO2, and you can see that the mobility now it's in centimeters squared per volt second. So this is only a couple hundred at low temperature. So enormous difference. Uh, the other way we can look at quality in uh, TMDs is uh, look at their optical properties, and so we can look at the the line width of the photoluminescence peak. Uh, and, you know, we can see very clearly that the, the, the PL line width is quite broad. When we cool down to low temperature, the, the width of the transition is still much larger than KT. Uh, so that tells us that there's a lot of disorder. In the system. And in fact, you can do some very nice techniques looking at uh, kind of, uh, you can use 2D spectroscopy. So the basic idea is that you have something called inhomogeneous broadening that at different parts of the substrate, you get, uh, you might have a very locally, a very narrow transition, uh, but at different parts of the, the sample, that narrow transition is in different locations and your laser spot samples, a lot of them. So effectively everything's broadened, but you can actually do some nice techniques to tease out the, what we call the homogeneous line width from the heterogeneous line width. Um, and, uh, you know, you can see even in these disordered samples that the intrinsic line width should be a lot narrower than what you see just in a simple PL spectrum. Okay, so we started, now this is, uh, you know, getting on 10 years ago, encapsulating TMDs inside BN, and we were wonderfully naive thinking that everything would be perfect just like graphene, which we know is not the case, but it's nice because it's kept us busy for 10 years as well. Um, okay, so this just in kind of one very quick slide, it shows some of the improvements that you see when you do encapsulation with HBN. So if you look at the, the uh, PL line width, you see, you do see that narrowing of the line width to the uh, very close to the limit of the, the uh, where we get rid of heterogeneous broadening. And so that we can, uh, you know, approach an intrinsic line width of the PL peak uh, when we get rid of the uh, environmental disorder. The other thing we see, and I just kind of put a dotted line here because there's a lot of data from different samples and different materials, different groups, but very roughly at low temperature, we're seeing a kind of a disorder limited mobility of 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, something like that. Um, when we encapsulate, you know, MOS2 or other TMDs inside boron nitro. Um, and so this is a, a nice improvement, but, you know, still nowhere near what we're getting with graphene, where we see, you know, easily a million or, or gallium arsenide. Uh, another way to look again is the, the quantum hall, but in this case, in the kind of, kind of traditional samples of TMDs, either you can get MOS2 mined out of the ground or crystals grown by chemical vapor transport or films grown by uh, uh, chemical vapor deposition. You can start to see some quantum oscillations, but we don't see uh, well-developed quantum Hall effects. But 
One thing you can do is, is look at the onset of Shibnikov de Haas oscillation. So you, this is your measuring uh, resistance as a function of magnetic field at constant density. You see kind of a negative magneto resistance, and then you start to see some oscillations. And the, the magnetic field at which you see an oscillation basically is telling you when am I starting to get a full uh, cyclotron resonance? So, you know, an electron or hole going around in one circle without scattering. Right? And so that basically uh, kind of gives you a measure of your what we call the quantum scattering time, which is a little bit different from the, your momentum scattering time. If you measure transport, you're really sensitive to backscattering. But if you're looking at the kind of coherence uh, in, in a Landau level or in kind of the cyclotron resonance, even very small angle scattering will change your behavior. I'll talk about that later. But you know, if we look at these samples roughly, we're seeing uh, you know the onset of Shibnikov de Haas at a few Tesla, right? So just as a as a, a rough number here, one Tesla gives us one volt second per square meter, or about ten thousand centimeters squared per volt second. So if we see the onset the onset of SDH oscillations at 10 Tesla, that says we have quantum mobility of about 1,000. We see it at three Tesla, it's about you know, 3,000. So, and that's very comparable to what we're seeing with transport. Right? So those are, those are comparable scenarios, right? So again, very good, but something is wrong. So this is all the long preamble, but I hope give some nice context to, to why, why we're interested in quality and how we, how we try to measure quality of these materials. Uh, so again, the, the issue here is that these TMDs have lots of point defects. And you can see that in, in STM images. This is an image of, yeah. Um, may I go first? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so I understand the bottom HPN is sort of uh, screening our, you know, because so the oxide has those charged disorders. And yep. HPN. Probably make the environment more clean and the sample can be better quality. But how about the top HPN? Right. So why do we need a top HPN? So yeah, that's that's a good question, right? So um you know the, the, if you can so the, the the bottom HPN, I think it does do some screening because it is a dielectric, but you really it, it's just a spacer. That's and so if you think about there's some potential as a function of position, if you're far away from that, you start to average over a wider area and that basically brings down the amplitude of your potential oscillations. Right? So the top BN really is, um, it protects us from environmental disorder. So, you know, when we do lithography, we have polymers and all of those polymers will stick to our surfaces. And now if they're, again, you know, 30 nanometers away, we don't have to worry about them as much. So really that's, it, it's, if you can completely clean off all the polymer residue from your device, you shouldn't need a top BN. Gotcha. But as we know that that's not as easy as one might hope. Yeah. Um, with the HPN transfers that you've been talking about thus far, do you need to do these in like a clean room environment or anything? Or can huh. you just do them in like a normal lab and somehow get magically beautifully clean services? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that is the crazy thing, right? Is that is that we've come a long way working in pretty dirty labs. We just did a cleanup of my lab over the you know holidays, and, and I was a little shocked at how much dust we have. Uh, that said, so we at Columbia have started putting our transfer systems into kind of clean room, like little mini clean room uh, setups to just you know. You still get dust and dust, you know, it, it uh, affects the quality of the transfer. If you have a little piece of dust, it'll get in the way. And you know, so getting rid of dust is good. And we've built a system for doing all of these transfers in ultra high vacuum as well. Um, that brings a lot of challenges. So we're still testing it. Uh, there's also certainly a lot of materials that are air sensitive. So those all have to be transferred inside glove boxes, things like that. But you know, these self-cleaning interfaces are, are pretty amazing. So you, we've gone a long way with pretty low-tech stuff. It's kind of surprising. Okay. Um, all right. So the, the basic issue here 
right, is that if you look at materials that are grown by different techniques, they have not only a different density of defects, but can actually have very different types of defects. And so in the, you know, I've been kind of telling this story to anybody who'll listen for a long time is that we in the field have to get serious about materials characterization while we're actually making devices and doing measurements, right? So there's kind of this world of synthesis and characterization, there's world of devices, and they haven't really, the Venn diagram hasn't had a lot of overlap. I think we're all starting to move in that direction, but it's very slow and painful. So we started to look at TMD crystals a few years ago. You, you, know, you have to really work on your friends with the, the STM systems to get them to spend any time on this because it's not really very uh, you know, sexy, exciting work. Uh, but you know, when we started looking at the crystals that we were buying from the, the companies that were growing and selling them, we were a little bit horrified, right? So this is a kind of a large scale STM image of, uh, of MOSE2. This is a smaller scale image, but we're seeing a huge number of a, atomic defects. So these look kind of highly spread out, but if you zoom in, you really see that they're centered at a single atomic site. Just the effect on the local density of states spreads out beyond that. So these are highly charged defects. Um, they're about, you know, but the density was something like 10 to the 13 per square centimeter, which is getting up to near 1% of, of okay. atomic sites, right? So again, if you compare that to the, the purity of silicon, which is, I think, what, 10 to the 9, 10 to the 8 per cubic centimeter, right? It's, it's ridiculously different. Uh, you know, gallium arsenic, same thing. So these, these materials can be really, really horrible. Uh, and it's kind of amazing that you still see a lot of the near intrinsic properties. Okay. But this is what got us into the world of, of synthesizing TMD crystals. We had not really been doing it before. We realized we had to do it. Okay. So uh, this is, that was a very long preamble, but let me talk a little bit about uh, synthesizing crystals. And luckily I'm going to have a much, uh, people who are much more expert in reading phase diagrams coming after me so I can go very quickly and go through this. But if you just look at this uh, kind of a phase diagram and, and try to understand it, and I'm still not, it, this is not a native language for me of, you know, reading phase diagrams. But if, if you look at this one, you, you know, you can kind of say, all right, there's this nice phase here of MOS2. This is atomic percentage as a function of temperature. And this is the phase we want. We want to grow the 2H phase of MOS2. So the natural thing is to mix a stoichiometric ratio, heat it up to uh, where we have both liquid and gas, and then just slowly cool down, right? Just, just you know, basically grow a crystal out of a, a, a melt and cool down, right? So that would be, that would be wonderful to do. So here's, here's the issue. I have one movie here, which hopefully will work. So this is us doing a little bit of a test growth of a molybdenum and sulfur inside a quartz ampule in an oven, well protected with metal shielding and a fume hood. Uh, and you'll see why in a minute. Let me skip over in the beginning. And you know, here we are hit. So now the temperature is 943. You'll see it. So we haven't gotten anywhere near 1700. It might go to 944 or something like that. These movies aren't usually that exciting, but every once in a while, every once in a while, there we go. <laughs> Something blows up. <laughs> so the problem here, right, is that sulfur has a very high vapor pressure, right? And so you can't, you can't safely put it in a quartz tube and heat it up to a temperature you need. You so. just happen to be recording that? Or, uh, that plan somehow? We'll say that. Yes, we'll absolutely say that it was planned. Uh, and you, yeah, anyway, so. All right. Uh, so this is kind of well known. You know, we, we made our, we weren't trying to go to 1700, but, you know, and we've, anyway. Uh, so this is why crystals are typically, typically grown with chemical vapor transport. So in this uh, technique, you seal your, uh, your precursors in a, in a tube, just like before, but you also include 
uh, some kind of carrier gas. So it's often, uh, say, I, a halogen, so iodine or chlorine. And mm -hmm. what happens is now you can form compounds of, say, you don't have to fully melt the molybdenum. Uh, the molybdenum will form some kind of moly molybdenum iodide, and then that will transport from a hot zone to a slightly cooler zone, still hot, very hot, and it will then react with the sulfur to give you your MOS2 or your other TMD crystal. So this works very well. You can get very big crystals. They can look very nice. It's very fast, which is, I think, a positive and a negative. When you grow a crystal that fast, you kind of you lock in a lot of defects. You're kinetically limited by uh, in, in your defect density. Also, you have to worry about the carrier species remaining inside of your crystal. Um, and so this led us to doing uh, flux synthesis. And the basic idea here is that if you have an excess of one element, you can uh, hope to uh, reduce the melting uh, point of the other elements. So if we have a, a calcogen, sulfur, or selenium, we have a very high melting point a metal like molybdenum or tungsten. We can basically, instead of just trying to melt that metal, we can dissolve it essentially in, a, in liquid uh, calcogen. Um, so that's that's what we do, um, and we then try to grow a crystal inside this melt of excess calcogen. We usually the kind of typical technique is you have a little neck in your in your uh, quartz tube. You put a little quartz wool in that point, and then once you cool down uh, past the point where you've grown crystals, but where you still have liquid calcogen. You pull your, uh, you pull your, uh, you open up your oven. You pull your uh, tubes out. You flip them upside down, and the calcogen metal will drain, drain downward. You'll trap your crystals your, in the quartz wool. You can put them in a centrifuge and really try to clean off the, the excess calcogen that way, and then do some post processing. So that's kind of been the standard technique for doing flux synthesis. And so what we've been doing, uh, this is much slower. This takes, we, we generally grow for about a month. Uh, and you know you can do very, very slow cooling. So it really seems to get rid of all of the issues of, of kinetics uh, that are, are tough with the chemical vapor transport. Uh, what we found to be uh, absolutely critical is to have, five minutes, uh, three, three, all right, is to have, uh, you know, a tight feedback loop on our materials quality. So the, the kind of the revolution for us was finding an unused STM, resurrecting it, getting it working again, and wow. basically using this STM for looking at our materials quality. So we don't have to ask our friends to, to take time out of their STM studies. We have one that our synthesis team uses just to characterize materials. This is amazingly slow and painful, but it works. and you know, we, we know what we're doing. And so we can see very quickly that we get much lower defect density. I'm gonna start going faster. Uh, what we've learned lately is that we really have to be very careful when we look at these materials. We have to in it, do this imaging at two scales because we have two classes of defects. So when we image at large scale, we see these very bright, uh, they can be bright uh, or very prominent defects. So either uh, they're bright, light colored or dark colored uh, defects. These are highly charged. But then when we zoom in closer, we can see much fainter defects as well, right? So, and, you know, we are still looking at what the heck these defects are. It's, it's been painful. I think we're gonna, we have some studies now that we're, I think we're gonna get some real answers in the next couple of months. But these char, we know that the those big bright ones are charged. They flip their color when you, change bias, uh, which uh, is kind of the smoking gun for a charged uh, defect. So we can see that there are these acceptor states and donor states. When we look at the much smaller defects, they are all somewhat similar, uh, but we, we, we think we see even kind of a few different types of these defects. Again, we don't know exactly what they are, but they're, they're probably related to calcogen vacancies, but they're not bare vacancies either. The reason we know that is when we do something called scanning tunneling spectroscopy, 
we don't see a big state in the middle of the gap. We, if we have a, just a bare vacancy, that should have a, a, a mid gap state. So we have some kind of something that happens at a calcogen vacancy that then either is, uh, you know, we have an oxygen in there or we have vacancies that kind of, uh, we have some kind of reconstruction at, you know, uh, at the vacancy that's capping off those, those dangling bonds. Okay. Let me tell you a little bit about how we've been improving the uh, flux synthesis. Um, we realized we kind of hit a wall a couple, maybe about a year and a half ago. We weren't getting any crystals that were any better. And, you know, we started to think, do we have still some contamination in, in, in our system? And we looked at this quartz wool, which should be clean, but it's got a lot of surface area. Right? So it's the first thing to get rid of. And so what we came up with was a, a two-step two flux synthesis technique. So the first thing we do is the crystal growth. We do that just in a bare, uh, a bare quartz ampule. And then we, we do the growth, cool it down to room temperature, crack it open. We basically now have a solid piece of selenium. So we're doing all this with selenides, not sulfides, because we can do that without blowing up our tubes. Um, we have solid selenium with a crystal of TMD inside it. We take that now and put it back into another quartz tube with quartz wool and just heat that up enough to melt the selenium. And then we can, we can separate the, uh, the crystals from the selenium. So just separating those two aspects. This post-processing is short time, low temperature, so it doesn't affect our crystal quality. And what we've seen now is that we, can, we have another powerful knob to change our defect density. So what we've been doing is playing with different metal to calcogen ratios. And what we've seen is that the charge defect density dramatically reduces when we grow in a very, very selenium rich environment. Um, so, you know, you can see we're really starting to get very few defects at this point. And in fact, we're also seeing the uncharged defects become very rare as well. And I assume this is like five nines. And it's as good as we can get, but we're talking to people about where we can get better. Yeah, we're, as I'll show, we're starting to get the defect densities that are kind of comparable to that four to five nine starting material. What about the transition metal? Same, yeah. I mean, we're, we're, we're using the best we can get, but we're looking for better sources. So I'm gonna ask you guys over lunch to see if you have any answers. Sure. Do you um, one more quick about the transition? Do you do anything else to process it before the growth, or do you just take it out of? Yeah. So we 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 do. We uh, we are very worried about oxygen. Um, you know, certainly oxygen can substitute for selenium or, or tellurium or sulfur, um, and so we keep everything uh, you know in a uh, oxygen-free environment. Um, generally, we take it as given and we use it immediately and we don't keep stuff around for a long time. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, why don't you guys use a uh, Canfield crucible sets? Are you worried about aluminum getting pulled into the melt or something? Yeah, so we, we've, we, we've done some of that uh, and we're probably gonna be doing, so Canfield crucibles are made out of alumina uh, and they're kind of basically specially designed for exactly this process. Um, they can be very clean, you know, alumina has, is, um, even higher melting point than S, you know, silica. So we can give you, you know, if we're worried about even silicon diffusing into our, or oxygen diffusing into our crystals. We have, we've bought some, they tend to be hard to integrate because we're growing at such high pressures. We need very thick walled quartz and it's, it's, it's like, it's just hard to get the, all the geometries get really nasty. So that's the stupid reason. Gotcha. Right. Um, okay. Uh, wait, 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 what depression are you talking about? So this is, it's about 30 atmospheres, I think. Do you just mean the vapor pressure of the? Selenium. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. And, you know, so we have to use a pretty thick wall of quartz too to have enough safety factor there. And everything is inside a, you know, through, through hard one experience, 
everything has kind of two layers of protection and ventilation and all that stuff so that nobody gets hurt <laughs> during any of this. We don't set any more fires. Um, okay. So again, you know, let me just in one minute or whatever I have left, uh, just show that, you know, we made some great progress. We've been able to re reduce this defect density down by another one or two orders of magnitude. Um, one thing we found is that there is a trade-off between crystal size and quality. So I can show you here that, you know, when we grow at five to one, we can get lots of crystals. When, you know, when we use a lot less metal, there's a lot less metal to make crystals and the crystals are very small. Uh, we've played around with Kind of a two-step growth where we grow it a we grow these the ones on the left and then put them back into pure selenium and do kind of a recrystallization and that we think is starting to give us the best of both worlds but i have to do a lot more study there um we are looking at different ways to uh do defect counting faster uh one of the ways we're looking at is conductive afm which is still slow. It still is finicky depending on the, you know, you really have to get a good tip, but at least you're not loading into vacuum. Um, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a little bit faster. And so we're working with uh, Matt Rosenberger's group at, at Notre Dame to do that. And it seems like we can see the same types of defects at the same density uh, with conductive AFM. Um, so again, we have, you know, a family of high purity TMDs selenides and tell, tellurides. I think we have some good ideas for getting the sulfides uh, grown where we can try to overcome some of the issues of, of high vapor pressure. Um, and just maybe show that, you know, we're starting to get, it's been very frustrating to get good contacts onto high purity material. Um, there've been a lot of beautiful papers on high quality contacts recently. All of those are on low quality material, relatively, uh, which I think makes it a little bit easier. As you purify your material, it becomes more intrinsic and contacts get harder and harder. Uh, so, you know, for us, that's been a challenge, but we, you know, we can really see high, you know, now mobilities in the range above 10,000 at low temperature, uh, integer quantum Hall effect in transport, fractional quantum Hall effect using capacitance techniques, uh, things like exciton condensates are starting to show up. Spin-dependent magnetotransport shows up very cleanly. Um, one thing we're, we've done recently is looked at, you know, uh, can we replace uh, our boron nitride with very high-quality insulating TMDs um, as a substrate for graphene? And the answer is, to some extent, yes. So we see when we measure the mobility of graphene on tungsten selenide, we see it's much higher uh, on our crystals than we can see in the CVT grown crystals. And we can also use the graphene as a way to measure charge disorder because the theory is now so well developed and it seems to match pretty well the, the charge disorder we're measuring with SKM. Um, and, you know, again, this is what we're seeing is much better than what's been shown in the literature using uh, other crystals. Um, we can also do you know, start to now do studies of what happens to the optical spectra when we change the defect density. Defects are very good at uh, recombining excitons, and so they will dramatically change your quantum yield. So we've seen, I think, the, the big thing here is we can see as we make devices cleaner and cleaner, we get a much higher quantum yield at low temperature uh, and uh, much more intrinsic behavior. We can measure lifetimes and really see the kind of intrinsic lifetime of, of some of these states. Um, one of the interesting results we've seen very recently with this is uh, Xiang Zhu's group is if they look at the photoconductivity using a terahertz spectroscopy, one of the interesting things is if you take relatively dirty material and you measure uh, photoconductivity, it, it has actually a relatively high photoconductivity. So you create X, electron hole pairs and you get conductivity. In our cleaner crystals, if you create electron hole pairs, you don't get conductivity because they stay paired, they're neutral. But in dirtier material, you have enough defects around that you get Auger recombination. You basically 
dissociate your some of your excitons and and you get free carriers from that so you get a this a little bit paradoxical result that the cleaner material actually gives lower photoconductivity because uh, your excitons are actually staying as excitons so i think there's lots more to do here let me just um, let me say this that i'll be here at least through lunchtime today i wish i could stay the whole week but i'm stuck as department chair and <laughs> we got a lot to do still to get ready for the semester starting tomorrow uh, but if you're interested i'm happy to talk uh, you know offline about really exciting recent developments in growing graphene on copper and discovering um, the hidden variables in this growth that we didn't understand before so I'll, I'll tease you with that and ask me later so thanks for your attention and talk yeah, yeah, I failed to mention earlier, I'm going to try to stop the speakers about 10 minutes or so before, so we have lots of time. You tried. So, you know, <laughs> that's why I say quiet. Please. I know. Okay, so please ask for it. So just, I was thinking about your flux growth, and just, I just had two thoughts that, they're more like comments and questions, but have you tried um, annealing your crystals in the melt? Once you get down to that temperature where you would centrifuge it, have we? Um, I, we've we've done a little bit of that. So the question is, have we? You know, can we anneal the crystals in the melt? Um, I mean, we're cooling very slowly, so you know, for a couple of weeks. So essentially, we're doing that anyway. I think. So, yeah. So I would tend to agree with you. That's yeah. what I thought in the past. But one of my colleagues and my students have started doing this sometimes, and yeah. at least for some of our intermetallics, it somehow magically improves things. Well, let's talk. So that's something to think. Uh, let's, I mean, let, let's talk. Fantastic, sure. yeah. I mean that you- uh, Just hang around. Up again a little yeah, little just hang around. Just stop. Yeah, and just okay. hang around. I mean, we kind of started doing it by accident. <laughs> uh, the crystals were more beautiful and- I mean, it, was, it, was, it was just something to consider. I don't know how it works. And then the second thing about the molybdenum or tungsten, to get really high quality, Pieces of that, I think someone would have to electrify a lot of it. Yeah. Yeah. So we're talking to folks at Ames Lab about that. And I think if we, we're, we're concentrating for the next couple of months on, we've got samples out to some STEM groups. Uh, we're trying to do elemental analysis, you know, sending it out to private companies that do that. Um, and we're doing STM. So all of the STM results I showed, I, I didn't mention this, are on samples that we exfoliate, uh, or we don't exfoliate, we just cleave a bulk crystal. Yeah. We have to worry a little bit about, are there, you know, uh, some of the defects we may be seeing are actually interstitials, which might not really be there when we exfoliate monolayers. So we're really concentrating in the next couple of months on getting good STM of monolayers. Um, all of this, I think, will try to really clear up what our defects are. And then, you know, I think we're going to start seeing molybdenum and niobium and, you know, all the other <laughs> beautiful soup of, of transition metals in, a, in our starting material. And that's once we know we're really, we want to put a few tens of thousands of dollars into refining our tungsten, yeah. that's what we're going to have to do. That's a hard one. Yeah. But if, you know, if we have, a whole bunch of other contaminants first, then we don't want to waste money on that. Okay. Um, so I have a question about the defect counting mechanism that you're talking about. So how do you like count the defects? Do you take into account the precursors, like the defect that might be like, uh, say, the purity of the materials? That yeah, so this is exactly what we're getting to. So, so far, you know, th this the limit of our knowledge is we can kind of classify the defects. We can take some guesses as to what they are, but we really still don't know what, um, you know, because we're not seeing in any of these defects, we're not seeing in gap states that really tells us we're probably not seeing just bare vacancies, which is hinting that what we're seeing is substitutional impurities, at least for a lot of these, or maybe interstitials. Um, you know, so if you have oxygen, for instance, that, that certainly can be a substitutional impurity, but other, other transition metals perhaps as well. 
So I, I think we're not, I wish we had that knowledge. We don't exactly know yet. And that's, we're kind of stuck right now as to where to go to keep improving because we don't know exactly what we're fighting yet. But in a few months, I hope there will be a lot of clarity. Uh, is there another question? Me? Uh, yeah, um, maybe this is a stupid one, but uh, I'm not quite familiar. Why? Why is the uh, like the metal melting point is lower when you put it in the uh, liquid phase chocolate? Is it like an alloy sort of thing? I, we're going to hear some wonderful things about phase diagrams. In the next <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I, to me, I think of it as just like a, a dissolution, right? I mean, you can salt is a very high melting point, but if you put it in water, it's it dissolves. Right? So okay. it's not exactly that simple, but I think you know something about entropy. All right. All right. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I was just wondering, like, the uh, STM is quite local. Uh, so you basically measure density, uh, but uh, have you checked with other techniques? So we're very interested in other techniques. So, you know, we were hoping be able to, you know, we, what we really want is some technique that we can take a bulk crystal, plug it in, in an hour, we'll have some good idea of the defect type and density. Um, we were hoping that, for instance, Raman spectroscopy, you often see papers saying, oh, we grew a TMD, you know, here's this beautiful Raman spectrum. What we've found is that we can't find, we've taken the bulk crystals and tried to get ultra high quality Raman spectra with beautiful signal to noise. It's a bulk crystal. Um, we can't see a difference between our best crystals and our worst crystals. That's, I mean, you know, so that's not to say there may be a way to do it, but we haven't, it's not an easy one. Uh, photoconductivity can be a very powerful technique, uh, kind of what I, you know, a little bit of what I showed here. Um, it really, different photoconductivity techniques can tell you about excited carrier lifetime, uh, which is, a, you know, very strongly related to defect density. It turns out that preparing a sample for photoconductivity is just as slow and painful as, as doing STM. <laughs> so, you know. We haven't found a quick method yet, but I'm, you know, very interested. Somebody's going to figure it out, and I, I, I welcome that. So hope yes. maybe somebody. Okay. A second question. Uh, uh, what do you think? Like, how your density of defects will change if you annul your crystal in vacuum jelly? Will it like, reduce this? Like yeah. So just, just if we just. Vacuum annealed our crystals for a long time. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, one always worries about if, if you heat in vacuum, you're going to start evaporating selenium from the surface. But we found for monolayers, actually, you, you can go at a, a few hundred degrees Celsius and we don't see that the selenium comes off the crystal. So I uh, don't know yet. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Uh, more like a like not a question, but like a suggestion. This works for like bulk materials, like metals, intermetallics. Um, if you compare the residual resistivity, um, it draws kind of a link between the defects present in the sample. Um, have you tried doing like this? Yeah. So the, the yeah the question is about you know a, a pretty straightforward way to. Look at quality in any metallic material is the triple R. Uh, and so, you know, you just put wires on your crystal, cool it down, and you look at high temperature versus low temperature. Uh, so we've done that. <laughs> there are metallic phases. Uh, there's a 1T phase of, or, uh, of uh, MOTE2. Um, and, you know, that actually was the material we started growing years ago. Um, and, you know, we can get triple R's of a few thousand for that. So that's a pretty good metric. All of the semiconducting phases, it doesn't work, it's, you know, um, until you can, you have to introduce carriers by gating, and then you have to make a field effect transistor, and then the contacts become a problem. There is a way to pour out it. Yeah, just... yeah, yeah. And, you know, we really want a kind of a rigor, even for the metallic phases, 
a rigorous map of triple R versus defect density still is kind of, we still want to do that. Any final question? Sure. I have some, some practical. Do you talk about, you know, what's a good way to screen your sample if you happen to find an STI? But what, what is the overhead that you incur, right? Not just like how sample prep, but having expertise on hand and, and all that kind of stuff, doing it right. How, how, you know, what's the challenge there? Or is it, is it easy? Mm -hmm. It's easy for me because I don't have to do it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, it's been, you know, I mean, STM is not the, not, it's not as painful as it used to be, but you still have to, you know, have one or two people who are willing, you know, on your synthesis team who are, you know, willing to really commit themselves to STM. Uh, you know, it's tip preparation, all of that, you know, nastiness. Um, but, uh, you know, I think, you know, once, once you've gotten over the, you know, you train for a month or two and then, you know, I think it, it becomes somewhat semi-routine anyway. I, you know, I don't know how to say that exactly. You know, you don't need the world's best STM system. This is mostly done at room temperature. You can do some at low temperature. Um, I don't know. Yeah. So I think these the fact that these cleave very easily also is well yes very fortuitous. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's a great play. You wouldn't do it on some material that would be very hard to clean. Exactly. Okay, well thank you very much.